I'm coming at you live from West Oakland, California on the rooftop of my warehouse. Um, today I'm going to give you everything you need to be successful in 2023 as a reseller. But the information I'm about to give you is timeless. But I'm going to go over the supplies that I use as a reseller and my process. And hopefully it'll be useful for you guys. So let's get straight into it. So as far as um, resale supplies, I've switched over 100% to taking photos on the camera. I'm not using my phone anymore. And if you guys look at my Poshmark, I actually am 100% happy with my photos. I think they look great. Um, and my my pictures on my Poshmark, um, once I changed them last week, since then, I've been averaging between $500 and $1,200 a day. So my sales like tripled once my photos became really good and I started listing consistently. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, there's a lot of things I want to talk about when it comes to why my items are selling so fast. And also, I'm going to make my video today that I film after this live on the four different categories of items that I've come up with. Um, okay, once you have your camera, I, want, I would recommend using a gray carpet. I'm going to go to Home Depot this week, um, pick up some outdoor carpet. I'm going to use outdoor gray carpet that you can buy at Home Depot. That way everybody can get the same background. Um, next to box lights, or if you don't have box lights, you can just use natural daylight. Um, I'm also going to give a backup for all these things. So if you don't want to use your camera and you want to use your phone, that's fine. If you don't want to use a gray carpet like me, you can use whatever you want, as long as it's clutter-free. I'm going to recommend a clutter-free neutral background. Then box lights. If you don't have box lights, use whatever lights you have. Daylight would be fantastic. Outside, I recommend taking pictures around noon in the shade, if you can do that, if you don't have any light system. Um, two plastic bins. Um, if you know what I'm talking about or why I use them, good for you. If not, that'd be a good reason to join our, our Patreon group, patreon.com slash the resellers podcast. We go over why two plastic bins, even though they're $10 each, might change your reselling career. I recommend a MacBook Air or a Mac Mini. Um, those are about 500 bucks. SD card reader, or if you want to, if you want to use AirDrop and Cloud Photo Transfer, that's fine, but I recommend SD card reader. Uh, I recommend a manual crank standing desk, um, and then a, a chair, um, 100 bucks for, 150 bucks for a budget for a chair, 100 bucks for the desk, 150 for a desk, that's a good enough budget. And then I recommend either a Brother laser printer or a Rolo thermal printer. If you want to go thermal, Rolo. If you want to go laser, Brother laser, I have both. That's all you need um, to make millions of dollars reselling. All those supplies, if you were to buy them brand new, would set you back $500 to $1,000. If you were to buy them pre-owned, you could get them for between $100 and $300. So it doesn't cost a lot to start this business. It is 100% the easiest business to start ever, bar none. Selling other people's stuff is the easiest business. If you have no experience, you can start with selling stuff at home. and pretty amazing but it is by far the easiest business because you don't have to make the product or do the marketing just find the item put it on the poshmark ebay mercari or amazon they find the customer for you you put it in a box the post office ups or fedex service one to three minutes this is returns cases questions offers and your promotions next go find 10 we sell millions of dollars worth of goods every single week on my whatnot at super discounted prices that is a form of liquidation so optimize liquidate which is lower the price, or finally, donate. So optimize, liquidate, donate is what I recommend for slow selling items. I'm gonna go over this in another video, but there are four different categories of items. Items that sell fast for a good profit. Good profit's gonna be defined by me as $20 and over, but you can define it however you want to. Items that sell for not good profit, but for a profit, fast. So I consider fast under 90 days. So three months or sooner, that's fast for me. So number one, sells fast, good profit. Ideally, your whole store would be things that sell fast, high profit. My current Poshmark closet, 80% of it is this. Sells fast, high profit, $20 or more. Second category, low profit, sells fast. I would say not very much in my Poshmark store is that maybe like 5% of the store, there are items that are going to sell fast, but don't reach that $20 threshold. This is my second recommendation. If you don't have a lot of money and you don't know what to buy, if you're buying items that sell quickly, you're going to be okay because you can at least get your money back and live another day. Category number three, items with great profit, so $20 or more, but they don't sell fast. You don't know how long they're going to take to sell. It could take a year, six months, two years. 
that's really dangerous because if you don't have a lot of money and you can't wait and you don't have a lot of space, items that sell slowly are not preferable, even if they sell for a lot of profit. But it's important to recognize you can't rush these items because you need to wait for the right buyer. I have vintage t-shirts in my, in my closet right now that are over $100. I actually think it might take several years to sell those because you got to find the right person that's going to pay all the money. You have to find the right fan who's looking for that shirt in their size to give you $100 or $200 for a shirt when you could just buy a reprint of that shirt on Google for 15 bucks. Why are they going to pay you 100 It's just got to be a super fan. So third category is high profit. Don't know how long it's going to take. Maybe a long time. Fourth category is what most people's stores are. It's things that don't sell fast and they don't have a great profit. So under $20 profit takes forever to sell. Those are the items I recommend you optimize, liquidate, donate. So if you don't have a store of that, you can skip that step and your reselling life will be a lot easier. But that's that part. Next is the sourcing. So I recommend you source 70 $20 profit items or more in 33 hours. So in the daily refinement reselling method, you only work seven hours a week with listing and processing. It's about half an hour a day, six days a week, and one day on Fridays for me, I list, eight, I list 80 items on one day. The other days I don't list at all. I just do customer service, shipping, and listing. That works okay on Poshmark. I think on, on eBay, I would recommend you list every single day. Um, when I get a little bit more mature in my Poshmark um, career, I will do drops. So I'll use it like eBay and I'll drop new items every single day. I'm just setting myself up so I can actually do that because I have to learn how to use the drop system. But then eventually I'll drop 10 new items every single day that are unique. Very excited about that. Um, and then I recommend at the end of all that, once a week, you guys spend five minutes a week doing your bookkeeping and accounting. If it takes you longer than five minutes, you're not doing it right. Um, and it means you don't know what you're doing, which is okay. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to take a lot longer than five minutes per week and it's gonna give you a big headache at the end of the year. So if you do it for five minutes per the week, I have here written down, you can file your taxes the first week of January when the post office is a ghost town. And you don't have to wait until the middle of April when everybody and their dog is waiting in line to pay their taxes. You will have already been done and spent your refund on more inventory to resell. So that's it guys, that's how you make millions of dollars reselling. I hope that this year in 2023, I'll make a million dollars profit reselling using this exact method. So uh, hopefully we have some questions for you guys. And um, if you guys have not been here before, my name is Chris. I run a liquidation company and also a Poshmark store and also my website where I resell goods that have already been sold before. Um, just got back from my 20 year reunion. I went to it on Saturday, I'm 39 years old. When I went to the reunion, not one person was impressed by my occupation of liquidation. So if you are doing reselling for clout, this is the wrong industry. Uh, <laughs> Nobody is going to be like, oh, you sell stuff online. My daughter's available. And there's no, there's no, no one like thinks that's a real occupation. And there are plenty of people in my class that killed it. Um, there's one gentleman who has a lawn crew with 15 different, he has a lawn company with 15 different crews. I would guess he makes several million dollars a year. He was best friends with a guy that went to BYU. Um, got a master's degree from a fancy school, raised $25 million and started the company Owlet. If you guys know that, they put, it's like socks for babies and it keeps track of the baby's pulse and um, whatever, that company kills it. He, he did $65 million last year. He's in my class. I would guess though that the guy with the 15 lawn crews makes a lot more money than the guy with the Owlet baby tracking device, but very cool. Two different routes, one guy, 16 years old, got a job mowing lawns. At 19, he became a minority partner in that lawn care company. About five years ago, he bought all the company. COVID hit, landscaping blew up. He made a ton of money. And the full cycle is back to where we are now because now we're almost 40 years old and he sold a minority share to one of the workers. So kind of interesting, right? The whole life cycle. He went through working in the same company for 24 years. I bet he makes a fortune. He has a very nice car. Everybody was super, super nice at the reunion. I loved it. And there was a gentleman that spoke at our reunion that was from the class of 73. So his 50 year reunion is this year. And it's pretty cool listening to people that are, you know, basically you 30 years from now. And it was cool listening to him talk. I was the class president of 03. He was the class president of 73. He just gave me a bunch of ideas like, hey, it's never too late. Um, 
you know, you may get an idea from going to a 20 year reunion and have be, be able to share something that you did at the 50. So I think it's never too late. I thought it was pretty cool meeting somebody that old. And I, it just made me realize also that nobody cares about, I can make millions of dollars reselling and I'm, no one's ever going to introduce me to their daughter. Like it's not clout, like private equity or investment banking or accountant or doctor. Those have a heavier weight in my opinion. Oh, you're an accountant? Must do pretty well. At least 60 grand a year. Maybe you bought a house. Maybe you have a, a timeshare. Oh, you're in investment banking? Maybe you drive a Porsche. Maybe you, uh, you have some index funds. You know, there's a little bit more into it, but then you resell online? Oh man, there's no clout there. So hopefully <laughs> there's some questions, guys. Uh, yes, and sorry everyone if it was lagging a little bit. Hopefully it settled down. Okay. Um, we're on the roof, so no internet necessarily up here. Um, Zane, yes, we answer, or Chris answers questions every Monday. Oh, mm -hmm. we're not going to take any questions related to my eBay account. Okay. Okay, <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> until, moving we, until we have new news. Okay. Yeah. Um, Zane's question was, if you had to start this business from scratch in the UK, how yep. would you do it from sourcing, packing to si packing and shipping? Very curious. Literally identically to what I said, except for the 33 hours sourcing looks a little bit different in the UK. I, I would go to car booths instead of car garage sales, but it literally is identical. There is, no there is nothing about storing things, shipping things, processing them, listing them, photographing them that's different in the UK or Antarctica or the North Pole. It's all exactly the same. The only difference would be how you source. So I recommend 33 hours a week of looking for stuff. 33 hours a week sourcing, seven hours listing, photographing, shipping. So most people do the opposite. They source for seven hours and they pick up a whole bunch of questionable items and they spend 33 hours a week processing it. My whole reselling life is completely different now because most of my time is spent sourcing. Um, Unplug75 says, how much sales should be expected in November and December compared to the current time frame for c clothing sellers? Depends on what you sell in the clothing category. As an example, this morning David asked, um, what do you think about women's clothing or men's clothing? If you look at the category, it's pretty slow. I would say definitely. Women's clothing, men's clothing, two of the worst categories for sell-through rate, under 5% sell-through rate, meaning a normal person listing a shirt or a, a clothing item, it's going to take them two to two to five years to sell it for a normal person. Not those of you listening to this channel because you're going to list it properly, good photos, good price, but a normal person, two to five years to sell an item. That's how saturated it is. They're just going to post polo shirt, orange, size large. They don't know that brand's important. They don't know anything. So you're competing with literally millions of listings. So the women's and men's category is horrible to begin with. So if you're just talking categorically, uh, if you have a thousand items in your store, uh, during the summer months, you'll sell one to two a day. November, December, you might sell two to three a day. Barely any difference between summer and winter months. If you're talking categorically for clothing, it's a horrible category. Um, if you're talking a specific niche in, in clothing, and it's totally different. Because if you're selling only t-shirts right now, that are related to the sports that are being played right now, you might sell 90 of your 100 items listed. But if you're selling boots right now, you might sell zero. So it really depends on what you're selling. Right now in my Poshmark closet, the slowest selling things are boots. The fastest selling things are running shoes, walking shoes. Depends on the seasonality, depends on what it is, but clothing categorically is the worst category on eBay. There are more sellers and more clothing items on eBay than any other kind of thing. So if you don't know what you're doing, you're, you're probably not going to have any sales. Um, B says, I am trying to remember a podcast or one of your calls about how much would you take for your inventory right <coughs> now to start over slash what is it worth? So that's a good question. I always recommend that you have the ability to liquidate your goods in one day. So meaning if you bought if I bought this iPhone, right, to resell, I would want to be able to put it on Craigslist and sell it in one day. As an example, this is an iPhone 13 Max Pro. I think, are we on iPhone 15 now? Where are we? I don't know, actually. So, guys, <laughs> um, this is an iPhone 13 Pro Max. I think yeah. it was like a thousand bucks new. If 
I were to put this online for $100, would it sell today, right? Probably. So that's the cash value. So if you want to be safe, you'd buy all of your items below what you could sell for today if you put it on, on Craigslist. A lot of people don't do that though. They'll buy like a J. Crew jacket for $12. You could not sell that on Craigslist in one day. Like it would be extremely unlikely that the 14 people who see that listing would want that jacket for $13 if you paid 12. So you wanna buy stuff that you can liquidate in one day as a reseller, especially if you're a beginner because you can't get stuck with inventory. The prompt that I asked was, how many people listening right now would take just what they paid for? You had a thousand items in your store, you averaged six bucks. Would you take $6,000 right now? Or would you sell those items over time? For me, there's no way I would sell my inventory for what I paid for it. It's so far below what I can get for it in a reasonable time frame. There's no way I would do that. Um, currently, I am stocking, I would say, around... Uh, inventory, uh, the money I've spent on the inventory I have right now, I would guess is around 300000 I have $300,000 worth of inventory in stock, right, that I paid for. So I'm out 300k. 300k of my money is trapped in my inventory, right? There's no way I would take 300000 for it, though. I think the lowest cash offer that I would accept today is five hundred because even in my liquidation model, I'm hoping that the 300K right now is gonna net me 720,000 because I'm hoping to more than double my investment. So the 300,000 I have in inventory right now, after I sell it, I wanna have 720,000 left. But if I wanted to sell tomorrow, I guarantee I could sell you, I could sell 100% of my inventory in one day with my audience. And that's important because you may not have a large audience that took seven years to build like me. You might only know the people on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. That's, that's as big as your network goes, which is, is usually big enough. But knowing that, you got to be more careful with what you buy. You have to have an exit plan. That's why when I got suspended on eBay, it didn't affect me that much because I already have channels to sell inventory and my supply chain didn't dry up. So um, as I continue to work towards that, um, I'm not going to really address that in, the, in, in, in lives until something changes because I, I need some new news to report back on. And right now, I'm still working through that. But you need to be able to liquidate your inventory instantly. If you're a reseller and you can't get out of your inventory, you're not liquid enough. You're buying the wrong items. That means you have Category 4 items. Category 4, no one's going to buy because they don't need, they don't need that. Like um, As an example, let's say that you have Category 1. Your store, all your items sell for $20 profit and they sell fast, under 90 days. All you have to do is not buy anything and 90 days later you get all your money back. I am currently doing that right now. Not buying anything, 90 days from now, I'll have $720,000 in my bank account from the stuff here. Don't have to buy anything else, that's it. But I'll be out of business, I gotta buy more stuff to continue. But if you have stuff that sells fast, category one, you just wait until your sell through rate happens and then it's gone. Number two, if your items are low profit but sell fast, same thing. 90 days later, all your items are gone. Number three, this is a little bit more dangerous because your items are high profit, but they don't sell fast. This scenario, you can still sell them though. If I were to say, you know what guys, I am selling, um, uh, let's say as an example, these sneakers right here. The, this is just a classic Hover 2 uh, Under Armour. If I was trying to get $40 for this, it might take 10 months to sell because I have to find somebody looking for this exact sneaker in this size, in this condition to pay $40. If I listed it at $20, it would sell right away. But $20 is definitely more than you would pay on at Goodwill for this pair of shoes. This pair of shoes at Goodwill here would be 12, 13 bucks. So you can make a small profit if you count this category two. But that's why I think everyone listening right now, all of your inventory should be category one or two. Don't buy category three if you don't have a lot of money. Category three is like, you have the money and the space to wait for it to sell. I don't have enough money or space to do that because I live in California where space is so expensive, labor is so expensive. I don't want category three and four anymore because I don't have enough space. Unless, maybe you're doing it at home. My Poshmark closet, if I decide to move it from here to my house, I can wait a year for items to sell at home. I just don't want to pay for a commercial space to have items sit. It's like, imagine how expensive it is to run, run a business and then pay to store items in it. 
it's like so expensive. So I want only category and category, category one and two items in my whatnot business. And B, I, I think it was a Monday live Q&A that we were talking about this, right? Probably a Monday live Q&A. I think it was a couple weeks ago, maybe. Yeah, the, my Monday before. live Q&As are some of my best videos, so um, maybe you watch them in reverse order after you join the group. Um, Amanda Green, hello. She says, Chris, have you made a video on here or in the group on a day in, the a day in your life since you started your Poshmark closet? If not, are you planning to? That's the first video of my vlog series. Yeah. So. You got a vlog camera. I got a vlog camera. <laughs> um, so. So I'm going to go over the outline with you guys right now. So Amanda, let me know if you think. So I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to give you guys um, a day in the life. I'm a regular guy, but I'm trying to make a million dollars a year. Um, and I have three priorities. Okay. So one is work. I want to generate millions of dollars worth of value. Number two is I want to spend time with my wife and I have two awesome babies. So I want to spend time with them. And number three, I want to do um, some personal development so I can be like the best version of myself so I can leave an impact on the world. That's like my three priorities, right? So in the vlog that I'm going to film this week, um, I'm going to try to integrate my theory behind my, like my personal daily refinement mantras in my daily life and go over what my day looks like. Okay, so um, I'm going to basically go over my... So the day in the life, I'm going to film it so you guys can watch it, but I'm up at 4.45. I am now walking to the gym. I used to drive to the gym, but now I walk. Um, walk to the gym, get my workout in. My workout's about five exercises I lift Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The opposite days I run. So um, 15 minutes, I walk to the gym. I am I'm studying this book called Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, trying to create these triggers. So the trigger in the morning is my watch buzzes and my phone buzzes. I get out of bed and... Um, into my gym clothes and then walk to the gym. That's my habit. I know that if you pick up your phone and start scrolling in the morning, um, you probably won't get out of bed because it's like really powerful and it's, it's like a dopamine genius. So you start scrolling on your phone, you're screwed. So I, if I end up scrolling, I won't go to the gym. So wake up. Um, my phone actually charges on my workout clothes. So I'll do this in the vlog. Go to the gym. I use a trainer on Wednesday, Monday and Friday, they, um, I work out by myself and then my trainer reviews it with me on Wednesday and he can tell if I was slacking because I won't be as strong. So, um, I'm going to be doing a DEXA scan <clears throat> tomorrow. So I'm actually going to track and see if I can reach my fitness goal by the end of the year. But tomorrow I'm going to go get the, uh, another DEXA scan and see what my body type is like. Okay. Then, um, go home. I do the mastermind call in the morning where we go over um, basic, basically people's habit stacks is what I care about. I want to know what your day looks like. So the Poshmark stack for me is I get to work 8.45 in the morning. I go pick my items. Um, so I, I got to ask you guys what you think. I was thinking of getting to work, taking out the garbage, and then starting my Poshmark routine. But um, the reason why is because people leave food in people leave food over like one during the day. So I'm not here at the end of the day because people are here after I go home. So I kind of want to get that food out of the, out of the warehouse as soon as possible. But I was also, it could be after, after I'm done with Poshmark two is the end, but I'm thinking garbage before or after. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll get a poll from you guys. Get to work, pick, ship, go straight back into my um, Poshmark room, photograph and list 10 items, put the items back, get 10 items ready for the next session. That only takes around half an hour. So my whole Poshmark thing is half an hour. You guys are noticing the live is in the afternoon now because I'm now switching to working on content in the afternoon. So in the morning, between 8.45 and 12.45, I gotta set up my, my staff so that they can sell 200 lots per day. So the goal for whatnot is 200 lots that are $60 or more. I wanna do 12,000 per day, Monday through Friday. And right now I have somebody working on Sundays, but um, I'm only, my, my goal is really just based on Monday through Friday. Sunday is just a bonus. So the first three hours of the day, I want to set up my staff for success so they have everything they need to eat to achieve that goal. Um, then 12.45, I'm going to eat lunch and take a nap. 
Although I'm, I'm fired up right now. I'm not tired. I don't know if I could take a nap today. And I haven't been tired recently. But um, the first couple of months of Dream Feed, I was like wrecked. But now I think I'm kind of used to it. So I think when, when July comes and I get to go to sleep an hour or an hour and a half earlier, I think maybe I'll unlock a new gear. But right now I'm feeling good. So 12.45, have lunch, take a nap. I'm going to try to vlog myself doing this. After that, I'm going to probably come up here and work on content until I go pick up my daughter, pick up my daughter, go home. Um, on the way home, we're learning Cantonese together, which has been fantastic. Learn a language with her, go home, be fully present with my wife, hopefully put my phone away. Um, I'm okay answering the phone because I still have staff here at work, but I would rather not. Dinner, hang out with my wife, um, plan. Right now, we want to do some landscaping, so hopefully my backyard will be epic. Um, so then do the landscaping, hang out with my wife in the evening, and then especially after the high school reunion, I just think I want to up my game. Because there's a lot of people who are like, I mean, my 20-year reunion is probably over 100 people who are divorced already. I mean, it's only been 20 years. So it's like pretty easy to let your relationships die, and I don't want that to happen. So I'm even more focused on that now. After looking at all those people, meeting everybody and seeing how they're doing, like I really don't care what they do for work. And I really don't care what they do for fun. I'm more like interested in their, their relationships. Like, is your family cool? What do you do with your family? What do you like to do for fun? You know, like that stuff's more interesting to me than, than work. But most people's jobs are just like, um, they do, they're a cog in the wheel, I feel like. Not a lot of people get to do their own thing. That's why, um, that's why reseller is such a weird word because you get to do your own thing, but you get, labeled as a person who's unemployed <laughs> it's not, it's, there's no clout in reselling but it's like oh i have a blog that might rank higher oh you have a blog that's cool what's it about cooking oh, that's awesome i love cooking that might get you an introduction to something but like you resell i don't know guys it's just for me i don't see that as a real job it's really weird right now because i feel like i'm doing pretty good but i don't have a real job well your audience is saying that they're proud of you Thank you for you guys being proud of me. Um, but I, I just think, literally, people were like, oh, that's what you do? <laughs> so there was no, like, no further, no follow-up question to that. So I was like, okay. Maybe they just don't know what it really means. Right? I, I think they're, so they're just, just like, like oh, okay. I think they think no. I, I'm I'm homeless, living paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> I don't, it was no, like, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they don't feel that way. But I, I was not getting questions like other people. Um, Not Too Nerdy Collection says, how soon should you worry about getting an LLC when selling as a reseller? I think that there's some tax breaks, right, when you're making about sixty to sixty to $100,000 net. Might make sense to incorporate. Before that, it doesn't make sense because you can get a resale certificate to buy things tax-free without an LLC. So I would say minimize your corporate exposure in the beginning and uh, don't, because you, you have to pay... There's a lot of fees associated with starting a company that I don't recommend unless you're making some money. So under under $80,000 profit a year, I probably would not sign up for an LLC or an S Corp. And most people don't report that much anyway because they think they're getting one off on the government. But then you're going to have less ability to finance a home, buy a car, do stuff later if you're always reporting that you only make $800 profit a year. So um, I recommend stay a sole proprietor as long as possible and once you're making 60 to 100k talk to a tax professional and maybe switch to a corporation cool guy 360 says what kind of camera do you use i'm currently using a sony zv one f stands for fixed so that camera that i'm using to take photos does not have um a interchangeable lens so i recommend any sony camera um under under five hundred dollars um any panasonic com camera under five hundred dollars or any canon camera under five hundred dollars for the most part um i went over this last week on the live but the canon elf which we recommend in the group the elf 180 it's now quadrupled in price because it's the one that we recommend but it's not required to use that camera. All, a whole bunch of cameras do the exact same thing. Um, you want a camera that's light, you want a camera that takes pictures quickly, and I'd recommend a shutter speed of at least one two thousandth of a second. 
and the Canon Elf has that. Also, do not buy a camera that does not have autofocus. Um, I bought a $50 camera on Amazon hoping that would work, but it doesn't have autofocus and it doesn't work. Like Manually focusing every item is too difficult for what we do. We just try to take photos quickly. So I would the cheapest camera I would go is probably like 150 bucks. And everything is on my link, bit.ly slash resource supplies. I believe I added my camera to my Amazon link. Video Games Explained says, Hey Chris, what's your opinion on selling brand new branded items from a distributor? Distributors. <laughs> or is it worth more selling used items? I'm experimenting with both and wanted to, your thoughts on it. Um, currently I am selling brand new items from last season. And um, I'm liking that because they're deeply discounted below wholesale price. Buying wholesale and selling for retail price is a bit different. Um, I'm not great at that. I feel like in order to compete with that, you need really good customer service. As an example, I buy all my camera equipment from Mike's camera locally because I like to go in there and talk to a, pers a person who knows what they're doing to explain to me what I do. So when I was buying a camera, I just went into the camera store and said, I need to buy a camera. And he said, what do you need it for? I told him and then he gave me a whole bunch of recommendations and they're all awesome. If you want to sell things for close to retail, you need somebody there that can help people make it worth it. Otherwise, they're just going to buy it on Amazon and crush you. So it's like really hard to sell something for $100 when it's on Amazon for 80 and that they get prime delivery and they don't have to go to your store and waste gas. So selling brand new items for retail, I don't know anything about that business. It's very difficult. Um, selling pre-owned items, I know a lot more about and that's safer because it's less outlay. Um, usually wholesale from a distributor is 50% of retail and a lot of resellers would cry if they bought something for 50 to sell for 100. They want to buy something for one and sell for 100. So it's just kind of a, a balance between um, being able to get a lot of profit per item and also the high margin. So w one thought is um, last week on the video game call, we have Jack who's a million dollar Amazon seller and that call has a lot of big heavy hitters in it and he was just talking about graded graded items and how it's so nice being able to spend 800 on something and flip it for 2000 instead of 8 and a 20 8 and a 20 8 and a 20 so it's like such a grind over all day to make 10 dollars at a time um, versus like make a couple hundred dollars each time and be able to put some of that money back into it but then it's insanely risky he was talking about buying something for 800 and then selling it for 100 so like that you don't have to do that very often until you're broke. So you got to be careful on those heavy, heavy items. Less work, but it's so dangerous. Black Swan says, hi, I'm thinking about starting as an eBay seller. Yep. seller. Do you think it's doable to resell from Europe to US or UK? Thank you. You are my motivation. It's harder if you have to ship internationally, but still doable. Um, you just need to find things that are hotter in a different market. So, um, I heard the number one market for washing machines is India. So if you were in the United States and you're making washing machines, you would need to figure out how to get them to India. So um, it just depends on what you're selling and what the market is. But there's plenty of people who sell only to the U.S. market. As an example, Mel in our group, shout out to Back From Burnout Mel. Her, um, what time is it in the U.K., guys? I hope it's not in the middle of the night. Because there's a lot of people, I think it is, I think it's like late at night in the UK. Um, back from Burnout Mel, she's an Australian YouTuber, but her audience is the United States, really. So she's trying to make videos that are optimized for the US, even though she's in a different country. I hope it's not too late in the UK, because I don't want my live to leave those people out. Yeah. I feel like when we did the lives at like 10 or 11, it was night-ish. I feel like it's them. like 8 o'clock in the UK. Maybe somebody in the chat can let us know. I feel like it's 7 or 8 o'clock in the UK. Yeah. Um, thank you, Minecraft, for the advice. I'll let him know <laughs> later. Um, Neelan John Das says, I am a new seller from India. Any word of advice for us new sellers from India? New to your channel, but all of your videos have made me much wiser so far. Thank you for all of the podcasts. If I was in India, I would sell locally to India. There are so many e-commerce websites in India, and you guys have a 
three times as many people as the United States. So, <coughs> excuse me, I would just apply the same advice, but use a different platform. Um, I'm not sure what the platform is in India for e-commerce, but I'm sure it's better than eBay. It's got to be newer than eBay and work better. And the shipping within India has got to be, got to be better than our system. So, um, I don't know though. Like in China, their e-commerce system is way more advanced. So I, I imagine in India it's pretty good, but I wouldn't sell on eBay if I was in India. Um, Video Games Explained says, Hey Chris, I've been sourcing items from Vinted and I've been crushing it, but could, it, could I still source from Vinted for the long term? I don't think so because a lot of YouTubers are talking about sourcing on Vinted to resell. This is in the UK, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like it's not safe to do that forever. I would try to get some local sources if you can. Do you need some water? <laughs> <coughs> I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Villa Fan says, does Chris still buy things with good sell-through rate and good profit, but not many have sold in the last three months? Yeah. <laughs> I do if I think I, um, the reason they haven't sold is because they haven't been marketed properly. But unknown brands, I don't. So, like, I just bought a whole bunch of Link Soul, and the, the, the sell through rate's not stellar, but that's because people are trying to get all the money. I think when I start selling Link Soul, it's going to sell like crazy because I'm selling it a lot cheaper. So, it depends on what it is because, like, Link Soul is pretty good, but it's like not as good as. Johnny O or Travis Matthew or um, Peter Millar. But if it's discounted, people will buy Link Soul over Peter Millar. So I think if the sell through rate is slower or non existent, it might just be that people are asking too much money for that particular item. But polos, dress shirts, dress pants, quarter zips, windbreakers, those aren't hard to sell. And we're in the warm season right now. Mm. They say it's around 9.45 p.m. in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Muhammad Ahmed says, Chris, $20 profit sounds like a lot. I don't think people in Europe would spend as much as they do in the U.S. Maybe I'm wrong. Not sure. I used to think that until like maybe six months ago. But now I think that there are so many rich people. Like I can't even... Like, I flew home, right? I flew to, U U oh, my old home, Utah, I'm back, right? And I, f I still fly coach, unfortunately. And first class is, like, super duper packed, and it's, like, a third of the airplane. So it's not like, I think people are not educated, and they don't know the things that sell for a lot of money. I would be, it's not possible in, U Europe is a continent, bro. <laughs> there's no way there's not literally millions of things that sell for a 20 dollar profit every single day in europe like ebay sells 173 million things a day and more items outside of the u.s than inside the u.s if that i should blow everyone that's listening away ebay sells more items outside of the u.s than inside of the u.s and 173 million things sell every day that's insane you should be able to find 10 $20 profit items if you know what you're doing in 33 hours a week. So in my in the daily refinement system, you have to look for 33 hours a week. You can't look for one hour a week. So 33 hours of hitting the pavement, meeting people, networking, researching, studying, looking on Vinted to find good deals. Although I think that I've heard that on a couple of channels now. So maybe, maybe that will dry up. If there's 100 people looking on Vinted for stuff, I don't know if there's going to be much to find. Sawoop says, Chris, have you ever fired a vendor? And if so, how did you go about it? Did you renegotiate or just try to end it on good terms? Oh, man. I just ghost them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, uh, if, if, if a vendor is not working out, I'll either say like, hey, the prices don't make sense anymore to me. Um, I can't pay this much. Or um, I reduce the order. Um, and sometimes the reduced order is not worth their time. So they'll just go, I try not to burn any bridges because it doesn't make sense to do that because you might need them in the future. So it's best to be cordial, but it, it just the best to keep it um, business and not personal. Just say like our relationship 
can only continue if these terms are met. If you are the buyer, then you have all the control. Um, the only reason that you lose the control is they are, if they are your only source, then, then they're in control. So just be careful. Have a few different people who can supply you. Be cordial. Do, do not ghost people. It's very rude. Uh, don't change your phone number. That's not, don't do that. Okay. Keep your same phone number. Do business with integrity. Grapevine is asking, what are some more examples of category one and two? Um, so category one and two. So I'll give you guys some examples from my store. I would say Sorel boots as an example. Sorel boots, Patagonia boots, North Face jackets, anything that you would find at REI. So REI, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's, the, all those brands are category two. They're going to sell for a great profit. Or, I'm sorry. Um, they're either category two or category three. So these are items that great brand, great item, Patagonia jacket. It's either going to sell for a small profit fast or a large profit over time. Category one is a subset of those items. So there's a specific Patagonia jacket that sells right away. There's a specific colorway of sneaker that sells right away. But it's, it's, it's a subset. It's not like a giant category of $20 profit store that sells in 90 days. That doesn't exist. It's a subset. Like I have um, probably 200 pairs of sneakers that I picked up yesterday at the flea market. I would say around 100 of them will sell within 90 days for sure. And the other, the other ones will sell um, probably in 90 days, but not for $20 profit. So category one and two is for me since I have limited space. Um, I'm actually excited to show you guys the space later. It's just that a show is going on right now, so I'm not down there, but it's totally different. Like people were saying like uh, whatever people were saying, all those things that people were saying are now different. So I listen. When you guys are like, hey, you should move this over here, I listen and now it's different. So when I show you guys this video on Monday next week, we'll film it downstairs. It's going to be really different. Also, I'm going to hook up Whatnot, which just added in. You can stream on the YouTube. So that's wild. I'll be able to stream my Whatnot stream right on the YouTube. That's new. Wow. That's crazy. So um, that is crazy. So next week we'll try it out. Huh. Um, Minecraft says, hey, Chris, have you ever thought about running a private label business? Surely it would increase profit margins as there would be way less need for sourcing and photography. Um, yes and no. So if you launch a private label product, you do all of the stuff up front. So as an example, Christine recommended some really awesome protein powder that tastes like milk tea. And they use monk fruit to sweeten it so it has zero calories unlike a regular boba tea which is like half sugar these ones taste great and i feel like that's a pretty easy business right you could private label milk you can private label protein powder you just have to make a flavor and the company will make it for you it probably would take you one to three months to set up right one to three months to set up get a supplier order it chris's milk tea protein powder make a website do some marketing I, that is not faster than reselling, but it has way bigger upside. Mm. You get the company going, you can sell the company, um, you don't have to list anymore. But all the flavors that I want, they're always sold out of. It's not, it's not easy to run that operation. Uh, I would say it is 100% easier to source stuff other people make. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to make stuff that's really cool, that's great. It's just that that's a totally different business. I think that most people who private label probably have a maximum of 10 products and I, I would like to do that but I think I'm still in the building mode like I think I'd like to have a couple million dollars before I start a couple million dollars for business like one of my business goals this year is to save five hundred thousand dollars in this business so I can use it for other other things like I have savings my business doesn't have savings I want my business to have savings to try stuff like private label but a simple product can take a hundred grand to start. So I don't know if I'm, I'm willing to, to risk that yet. Johnny Utah is asking, does anyone know how many staff he has? I have three full-time employees. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. I have three full-time employees, but they work 32 hours a week. And Christine. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> who does YouTube? So there's... Um, in California, you have to be 30 hours a week to be considered full-time. Mm. Um, and 
none of my workers want to work 40 hours a week. So unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a full-time worker. Um, but they all have um, paid time off. And I buy lunch on Thursdays. And there's a few other perks of working here. But um, they can... This is pretty amazing to me. The three workers that I have for me can support themselves in California with the wage I pay, which is, I'm not going to say how much, but it's at least twice minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing to me because I don't get to work four days a week. <laughs> they work four days a week and they can live in this beautiful city. And uh, I have to work seven days a week to, to live my dream. But that's just part of it. Um, Mohammed says, hey, Chris, do you have any free time anymore for me i'm waking up early gym listing photography pay, packing shipping learning korean as a language sourcing for two hours and then sleeping <laughs> um i do have more free time recently uh, just because i've been getting more efficient so um i didn't at first though i didn't have any free time for a long time i actually was just thinking about, it's about nine years i didn't have any free time now i feel like i have lots of time in fact so much time i'm going to be working on youtube four hours a day so starting now, it, it takes a long time to get there. I think a lot of people are so impatient. They want that free time right away. Um, I don't really see the balance of it working like that. I kind of see like, um, hold on, let me start this call real quick. Mm -hmm. One of the calls in the group. One of the calls in the group. We are just ending the toy call right now. We're starting the ephemera call, ephemera and printed items or ephemera is old printed items and coins. So Carl is calling this call minted and printed. <laughs> so minted nice. and printed is starting right now. Carl's like, uh, he feels like he's like 500 years old. He's very old and he's been doing this for 40 years. So um, Carl is our expert in pretty much everything. I'm going to set him up right now. Carl is also a licensed auctioneer. Wow. So he has experience with the live auction in person as well. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that, guys. There are 18 calls per week in our group in pretty much every category. Um, I would say clothing is the most difficult category. It's the easiest one to start, the hardest one to master. Mm. Zane is asking, hey, Chris, do you know about the about taxes in the UK? Taxes increase as you get richer. In the U.S., from what I heard and research, it seems like you get more advantages the richer you are, which is crazy. K kind of. Um, so, you're talking. There's two different tax things in the U.K. There's like one at seventy thousand pounds and another one at a higher one. Um, we've done the math in the group. And there's also a U.K. specific call with bold, f bold fines. You want to pay all the taxes. Like, as to give you an example of how taxes are not cheaper, at least in California. For my income goal of $500,000 in the bank after tax, I have to make a million dollars. So 50% taxes. I have a lot of tax advantages, but 50% tax sucks. My tax bill is six figures. So when you guys um, are in, like in the UK and you get that extra bill at 70K for the VAT, that's just, you don't have to stop there. You can just keep going. So you got to keep going until you're crushing that goal, paying the UK all the tax. I don't know how it works with the queen, but maybe you finance a little bit of the royal family. Um, or not the queen, the, uh, not the king, the, what is that thing called? The, the royal family? I don't know how, if your taxes go to the royal family at all or that's completely separate, but you want to be paying all that money and you want to be way past that 70,000 VAT rule. In the U.S., there are some tax advantages to being poor, but I, I think it's better. It's better to pay a lot in taxes and have more options. Um, yeah, like my like my minivan, is six thousand seventeen pounds, so it's over the weight limit, where you can write off eighty five percent of it. Um, it effectively ends up being like a twenty per twenty twenty five percent discount on the car. Um, I don't know. It, tax taxes are not my. I'm not a tax expert, but I do know when you make more money, it's better. Paying more taxes is not a good reason to not big, build a bigger business. You can also um, invest the profits into your business and take and defer the tax. You can do that in, in any country. Um, so that, that's one way to, to minimize your tax burden is to invest it into the future. 
Lettuce Wishes says, I'm trying to get into the Walmart marketplace. What do you think? Walmart's great. Um, it's the same as Amazon, maybe a little bit less competitive. But you just got to have the right buy cost. Hmm. Roaming with Rover says, I don't understand how to plan for shipping costs. That's a good question. Um, so it's really, really important to understand your shipping costs and optimize the items you sell for the proper shipping costs. So everything under one pound is considered first class, which I think first class in the next five years will not be around anymore. Um, priority is one pound and above. Really, really important for you to understand first class shipping, priority shipping, priority flat rate shipping, priority cubic shipping, FedEx ground or FedEx ground and home, um, UPS ground, UPS two day, um, USPS express mail, those are the main ones. Once you know all of those different things, you'll be okay as far as understanding what to charge your customer. Um, if you do free shipping, you have to build all those costs into your item. So, for example, large corporations can do $100 free shipping. If you're not a large corporation, though, you might need to be at like $85 plus $13 shipping. Luckily for you, you can type everything into something like Pirate Ship and get an estimate of what your shipping would be. I would pick the furthest location from where you are in the United States to use that as a, a reference point. And then remember, flat rate is your friend. Flat rate, it doesn't matter how far it goes. It just matters if it fits into a certain size. That's how I would approach it. I would learn flat rate, cubic rate, first class, priority, couple of UPS options, couple of FedEx options, and you'll know everything. It'll only take you one or two days of studying to figure out what all those different things cost. Why asked this thing, what do you think of drop shipping on eBay? Drop shipping is very dangerous um, because you don't have the item in stock and your account health is so important in the beginning. It 100% works, but it's dangerous because you can get defects fast. You have five items that you sold and they're all out of stock on the website. You can either buy them at a loss on a different website and fulfill the order or you have to cancel five orders, which can put you below standard. So. Dropshipping is all right. Plenty of people do well on dropshipping. It's just not my recommendation, especially if you have more than 10 items. I'd say if you're going to dropship, try to just get really good at the supply chain for 10 different items and be more of a dropship sniper than the bulk model where you're listing 20,000 items. That sounds really scary to me, like really, really easy to lose your account. Black Swan says, I had an idea about finding someone who can upcycle clothes and try to work with them to resale upcycled clothes. Do you think it may work? I think upcycled clothes are very difficult to sell in, in mass quantity. They're very individualized. Like if um, I gave Christine 20 pairs of jeans to bedazzle and she <laughs> upcycled them and made them beautiful with rainbows and butterflies and <laughs> boba teas and unicorns and mangoes and bananas and llamas and they're cool right and of course um i get them at goodwill for two dollars and then she does her thing and now they're forty dollars um it's hard because i don't she would need to figure out what her time is worth so whoever is right, yeah. making upcycling them to make them cool that costs time and money and then you have to find the right customer mm -hmm. and you can't like Levi's 501's unicorn pattern. Hard, hard to like put that into the title because no one's really searching for that. You need to like have that pair of jeans near a high school and a 15-year-old girl wants a unicorn on it. That Then she sees it and then wants it. Upcycled clothing to me is really hard to sell. I know lots of people do it at fairs and farmer's markets and stuff, but I, I don't, online I'm not, I don't know how to bring that customer in. Maybe on Etsy. Yeah, probably on Etsy. Yeah, but maybe on Etsy. it almost narrows it down to this very specific person. Yeah, it almost makes it too for. narrow. Yeah. Um, Zane says, hey, Chris, so I'm currently sourcing from Vinted as well and car boot sales in the UK. Where else would you recommend sourcing from? I sell mainly toys. Hmm, toys in the UK. Um... Can somebody link Zaheer's channel? I think Z in the UK knows a lot about where to find toys, but essentially I would try to figure out what happens at the thrift store to the items that don't sell. 
because like that here in the in the states, when items don't sell at the thrift store, they get auctioned off to private companies. And then I work with a couple of those private companies, and I am hundred percent certain that it works the same in the UK. So somewhere, when the when the charity shop receives the item and then they they liquidate it when they can't sell it, whoever they are liquidating it to would be your your next bet. It's not going to be something that's easy to find right away, but I think it's actually more mature in the U UK and, and Europe than it is here. Here, I feel like most of it goes to Salvation Army or Goodwill. In the UK, there's probably more private companies that are more secretive. I don't know. I don't know all. Like I know there are certain like um, brands that all get filtered to one person, or like certain categories all filtered to one person. I'm sure that exists. I think it just starts with. I wonder. I wonder if they, at car boot sales there. Are, there are ones that happen every single week at the same time because that is how our flea markets work. And at the flea markets, there's always the same vendors there. I sell the same kind of things that are buying auctions from thrift shops and thrift shops and charity shops. So I wonder if it's the same in the UK. I'm assuming it is because you guys are just as overweight as we are, and people's clothing doesn't fit. So I imagine the UK has the second most donated clothing. I don't know if that's true, but it would be hard to believe that they don't have the second biggest thrifted clothing or toy market because it's uh you guys have an affluent country and people don't have that much space <clears throat> toys is such an interesting market because my two-year-old if we don't she doesn't play with the toy for a month she'll have forgotten about it mm. it's a new toy for her because <laughs> yesterday she was like present i'm like I, I didn't bring you a present she's like go get me a present and she knows that she knows we recycle the toys mm. So for her, it's a present because she doesn't know. She <laughs> you thinks, like put them away? Put, we, we only have 10 toys out oh, at okay. once. Yeah. So put the 10 toys away and put 10 new toys. Uh -huh. And she thinks of it as a present, even though it's the same toys, just recycled. <laughs> but, um, that, but it makes me think there's a lot of toys that are in really good condition because like, they may not get played with beyond the first couple of months. Mm -hmm. Uh, Minecraft. I'm Christine, the videographer slash video editor for for his YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm glad you like my voice. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Strad is asking, do you do any fishing? I oh, that's your question. <laughs> I would love to. Um, so I do do um, over here on the pier. I do do some crab fishing, which I love. Really? Yeah, I love it. What? Crab fishing is awesome. So, um, go out there with the cages occasionally. I've only I've only done it once the last couple of years, but I used to go all the time because it's really fun to me. Um, I'm not sure you're supposed to eat. It's Dungeness crab out here. I'm not sure you're supposed to eat it, um, but I do. Um, I'm just wondering how da how dangerous is it to eat Dungeness crab from the bay? Probably, I don't know. I don't know how dangerous it is, but I, I do love crab fishing here. And then I went fishing for rays um and wow. rockfish recently so any let's do a restart meetup who wants to go um lean cod and rock cod fishing i want to do it it's in monterey it's so fun uh only thing is that i don't is it drama mean i don't like taking it um because it makes me feel really weird but uh, you will get sick the water is so rough <laughs> so I, i'll go i'm not gonna take drama mean i'm okay being sick for a couple of hours but it's really fun. So let's go um, rock cod fishing. And rock cod are the laziest fish ever. So if they get on, you just reel them up. They don't even fight. <laughs> but if you get the lean cod, those things are awesome. So I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Maybe I can find a picture. Lean cod is like the funnest thing to catch. At least that I, that I know out here. But I would love to go fishing with people who know what they're doing. Mm. They look like aliens. I want to... I don't know, it's really bright out here. I don't know if they can see it. Their mouths open like all the way open in the front. Not quite. Okay, it's really bright. <laughs> Just look up lean cod. They look ridiculous. But they're fun. So, um, lean, cod. lean cod. Oh, is it ling or ling? ling. Or lean? Ling? It might be ling, ling cod. Oh, okay. 
but I, I love it. So let's go fishing. I would love to do a restart meetup that's fishing. I think about four to twenty people. That would be so fun. Um, Michael W says, "When should I stop acquiring items to sell if my sales aren't there?" Immediately. If your sales are not there, stop buying. You need to be only financing future purchases with profits from sales. That's one of my rules. Mm -hmm. So only buy. So right now that I have this amount of money that I have in my my whatnot inventory, I'm not ever putting my own money in ever again. The money that is produced by this inventory buys the new inventory. You have to have that rule. So start at home, sell stuff around the house. If your items are not selling, you need to go in there and do the three things I recommended. Optimize first, then liquidate, then donate. There's a lady in the group who she's just been, she's just been removing 50 items a day and donating it and continuing her listing habit of 10 and her store is on fire. So 10 good items a day and remove, she's just straight donating 50 items of garbage out of her store every day. And eBay is starting to trust her more and more and more and the sales are going up. So that's extreme. You don't have to donate it, but at least liquidate, which means discount them. And then at, a, at the minimum, optimize. So if your sales are slow, do not go buy more stock. Absolutely not. Matt is saying, I just got my first defect on eBay. Yep. How much should I worry about this? How much do you sell? If it's like you only sold 10 things and you have one defect, that's 10%. If you sold 100 things and you have one defect, that's still a little dangerous because you need a 0.3% uh, transaction defect rate really to be um, still above standard or top rated. So I would focus more on not letting that happen again. You shouldn't get defects though, because you should be able to respond to cases immediately. And when somebody returns something, check on it immediately. So you shouldn't be getting defects. Um, but one usually will be ignored. So usually like one to five defects, usually if you're doing any kind of volume will not affect you to the point where it starts to affect traffic and sales. But just be careful. There's no reason to have those defects on your account. It happens once in a while and it will not affect your traffic if it's once in a while. Video Games Explained says, Chris, if you don't mind sharing, how much are you making from YouTube? I'm curious what the CPM of a business content creator really is. A lot of people lie about it and you're the only one I trust. It's like six, six to 10,000 a month is what my channel makes. Let me see. For a while, my channel did not make money. It just, um, I just gave it to my videographers. But now, since I only have Christine a little bit, um, here, let's look. This year, my channel has made forty nine thousand dollars. So, it's hard to see. Forty nine, forty nine grand is what I made this year so far, uh, just on the AdSense. So the first half of the year, fifty. Second half of the year is a lot busier, so um, uh, it it makes um, twenty dollars CPM. It's a lot. It's a really high CPM. Zane says, hey, Chris, so you said these private companies have control over the charity shops. Yep, they do. Items. Mm -hmm. How would you approach them and build connections with them? When I, I enter a shop, how do I start? Oh, man, I, I don't know. That's not, I think you have to start from the, the, the car boot. I think you have to start with where they sell their items. Mm. Um... I don't know if you can go straight to the like knock on the door of a big building. I don't know if they're gonna they're gonna answer. Like I buy my stuff from the flea market. They are the private companies that buy from Goodwill and Bulk. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about how it works in the UK. I just know for sure there are private companies that buy the, the stock from charity shops, and some of those private companies might just be two people. Some of them might become like hundred people. Mm. Um, Black Swan is asking, is it worth it to send product from Alibaba straight to the buyer as a reseller? I saw it on YouTube as a side hustle for people who don't have storage space. You can. Um, there's a company called Doba, D-O-B-A. They're trying to become an affiliate on my channel. 
and they've been around for a really long time. When I lived in Utah, Doba was just starting. But um, you can drop ship directly to customers. It's just not the best experience because you don't know when they're going to ship, how long it's going to take. You can't do any of the customer service. So it's not recommended, but you got to do what you got to do. Some people listening right now are in Fiji and they they want to sell stuff in the U.S. So they're going to figure out how to drop ship any way, anyhow. So it works. It's just um, you have to be careful and then you're regarded lower than people who have the item in stock. Mm -hmm. um, Mohammed says, hey, Chris, I'm currently doing um, 1,800 pounds a month drop shipping from Amazon to eBay. You got me interested in reselling. How would you source items as a beginner? I'm good at selling, but not sourcing. Um, first thing I would do is join the group, go to the tech and sports section, listen to the zip code call, and you'll go over how to find things in your local zip code um, that sell for $20 profit or more. And then once you have the items that are found in your area commonly, you would need to make a route of where you would want to go during the week this is really important. So based on my reselling advice, you only spend seven hours photographing and listing, prepping. It's only seven hours a week. It's 33 hours a week of looking for it. So it's a lot. It's a lot of shopping. It's a lot of driving different areas. It's a lot of figuring out in your area. Like I, I can, as an example, I know the TJ Maxx over here where I'm pointing, where I'm not going to show you guys, but over maybe you can triangulate where I'm pointing. The TJ Maxx that's over here is very profitable, but all the ones over here are not. So I know that because I've been to all of them doing retail arbitrage, and the one right here, they have, like, for example, if I go to this one right here, I will be able to find at least one Robert Graham that's all super patterned for, like, 20 to $40 that you can sell for close to 100 in this area. Also, this, okay, this area that TJ Maxx's suck. Over here, the TJ Maxx's carry Johnny O, which is a great resale brand. So I learned that from a long time ago with Jake. There's a guy that went with me to all the different stores locally, and he showed me that they're, like, regional. Like, for some reason, the ones over here get Johnny O, and none of the ones over here do. And for some reason, only this one gets Robert Graham. Mm -hmm. So if you just know which stores carry what stock, you would know. And if you did the zip code call, you would know that in this area, a lot of people sell Robert Graham. A lot of people sell Johnny O. Um, yeah, just going to be depending on your area, what you find, and then you're going to have to make a route, and then you're going to have to spend literally 80% of your reselling career is just sourcing. Mm -hmm. um, Scouse Dan says, Hi, Chris. I have 281 active listings, mm -hmm. and I have 69 drafts. Is that a good ratio, or would you say I should upload more? I'm currently uploading five daily and selling two to four daily. I think you don't need more than two weeks a draft bank so if you're he's posting five a day um yeah. five a day is 70 in the draft bank so once you hit 70 start increasing your listing goal so you're almost there mm. you're pretty close to right to where it doesn't make sense to have that big of a backup so just start listing a little bit more. start listing a little bit more probably list eight a day instead of five mm -hmm. and see if you can maintain at least four sales i like the ratio of half of the items you list sell and that's also one of the reasons why my Poshmark is working is because when I list one item, it's not one item, it's 10 because I have at least 10 of the item. So like it's a huge store, even though I only have 63 listings, I have 50,000 listed. So right now I'm not going to have less than 1% sell through rate. So I'm not going to have less than $500 a day on a sales on Poshmark because of the volume of stuff that I have listed. So in this situation where you have replenishables, you still can't rest on your laurels. Is that the right term? Still can't rest. You have to list unique items no matter what. So I'm currently working on that to make sure that I can get the right number of items in my store over and over again. But new items, consistently putting in new items, item optimization, that's the key to the game. So if you're selling two to four and only listing five, you already optimize. You're already listing good items. You can increase your goal a little bit. Uh, also depends on your risk tolerance. Like some people um, want to make sure they have two weeks ready to go. Other people are happy with just one week. And if you're very, very consistent, you could get away with it for years like tech and have no draft bank. Just never miss your listing goal. Mm -hmm. um, we've been going for about 
71 minutes. Let's go two more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Two more questions, guys. And thank you, John. <laughs> Zane is commenting about your reunion. Chris, you got me now thinking when it comes to your reunion meetup. Why, so, why are so many people obsessed with respectable jobs rather than income? I don't know. But um, <laughs> it's kind of for Paul to ask how much money do you make. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because I, I remember the one day hunter got junk guy. He was mm. like going to a PTA meeting and they're, they're like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I'm a garbage man, right? <laughs> and he's like, nobody asked me any more questions the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes like $40 million a year. But he's a garbage man, technically. Mm -hmm. But nobody, uh, they didn't ask him any questions. So I think people like... I don't know. I, I mean, I've been at Jaws before, and a, do a doctor straight up asked me, like, I chose to be a doctor. When when do you want to start making a difference? And I'm like, okay, bro. <laughs> so it depends. It's not, it is what it is. Like, people try to pigeonhole you. So doctor, lawyer, accountant. Right. I think there's nothing better than pro athlete, though. I've <laughs> actually only met a couple of pro athletes in my life. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do you do for a living? Pro athlete? Oh my goodness. That's like, that was up there. That's like astronaut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many astronauts have there been? Not that many, right? How many people have been to space? I bet less than 10,000 people have been to space. Mm. So That's like the rarity of the experience. The rarity and how hard it is to become an astronaut. Mm -hmm. um, like, um, I, I would guess he's either the most successful or second most successful person in my class. He's in private equity. When you Google him, it shows up what firm he works for. And to get into a private equity firm, it's very hard. You have to go to a really good school. And you basically, they pull from only two jobs, management consulting, investment banker. So you need to go to like the top 10 schools and work for Bain Management Consulting Company. And your uncle is in the business. That's like very hard to get into that. So if you say private equity and people actually know what that means, I would say that's like the elite crust of the finance world. But if you say private equity to somebody who runs a lawn care company, they have no idea what you're talking about. You probably make more money than them, but they're going to look down on you. So it's kind of interesting because like here there's a noodle shop with 13 locations and the guy drives a Rolls Royce. He's killing it, right? But he runs a noodle shop. So he could say, I have a noodle restaurant. And you probably wouldn't give him that clout, but he probably has a yacht. So it's interesting, right? And it's not even, I'm not even saying that having money makes you above somebody else. It's just that in our world, you can actually keep track of somebody by their job and how much money they have. Kind of like a scoreboard. Um, have you guys seen that, that show with David Golden on Netflix? I haven't watched it yet, Golden Auctions, but... He said that he does everything for ego, money, or competition. Ego, money, or competition. And my wife was like, pass. I'm not watching that show with you. <laughs> she doesn't care about ego. She doesn't care about money. She doesn't care about competition. <laughs> what would be the point of her watching that show? She wants, like, her values are like, is the family kicking ass? Do we have, do, she wants financial stability, but she doesn't want to be number one. So it depends on your, your values and your needs. And in Utah, I think family is number one for most people, but it's just different. Nobody rolled up in a Lamborghini. Nobody did any of that. Um, there were some people that my wife says that I shouldn't comment on people's physical appearance, so I will not do that. But I will say that, hmm, how do I, how do I <laughs> talk about physical appearance without talking about physical appearance? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just say that some people look better than they did 20 years ago and some people look worse, mm. right? And I think the people who look better, they wanted you to know. That's it. <laughs> some of the people who look a lot better now, they showed it off a little bit. That's pretty much it. That's all I have to report back from that. Um, it was a good experience for me. I enjoyed it. I went there Saturday afternoon, hung out, my, hung out here, went over there Saturday afternoon, flew back Saturday night, just went to the event and came home. And I still went to the flea market yesterday and killed it. 
Um, yesterday I did take a nap though because my flight was delayed, so I didn't get home until two, and I had to go to the fleet at four. So it was like a, a quick nap. But for some reason, I feel great today. You're talking about a.m. right? A.m. I got home at two a.m. <laughs> and I went to the fleet back at four a.m. Um, I don't know. Wait, I, and you've been up since? No, no, I slept last night. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, I slept last night. Yeah, yesterday I felt a little bit tired, but today I feel fine. Okay. So, I don't know. Uh, also, the last five days in a row I've been waking up with no alarm. Really? So, that's new for me. At the same time? At the same time. Consistency? Yep. Interesting. Um, I'm probably going to get a whoop. So, if you guys have any recommendations for if you like it or not, please let me know. But I'm thinking about Fitbit, switching it from my right hand to my left hand. Adding the whoop right here and getting an aura ring. <laughs> the reason <laughs> I want to do that is because I really want to improve my sleep. That's really the, for me, that's fine. I'm not LeBron James spending millions of dollars on my body, but I do want to sleep a little bit better. Mm. So maybe we'll take one more question. Um, Ivor Mechton says, as a small seller, is pushing back shows to gain bookmarks on what not a solid plan? It's all right. Uh, I think it, it doesn't matter, though. You, if you have 50 bookmarks, I would just launch. I wouldn't wait for thousands of bookmarks. It's not worth keep to keep pushing it back. But we're going to head out now. Thanks, guys. Um, look forward to my vlog coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to try it out, and you guys let me know if that format's going to be good. But I want to do my live Q&A, a vlog, and then my Wednesday morning live with the Mastermind Call. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.